Yes, we're open. Living Faith with Needham UCC, a sermon podcast from the Congregational Church of Needham United Church of Christ, where no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you're invited and welcome. This sermon for Sunday, October 15th, 2023, is entitled Mirror Image. It's a reflection on a reading from the book of Psalms, Psalm 50, verses 14 through 23. If you enjoy this podcast and would like to find out more about our open and affirming ministries at the Congregational Church of Needham, United Church of Christ, simply head over to our website, www.needhamucc.org. Thank you. Our reading today comes from the Hebrew Bible from the Psalms, the common hymnal of both the Jewish and Christian faiths. Psalm 50, verses 14 through 23. We hear today from the translation prepared from us by Reverend Dr. Wilda C. Gaffney in her A Woman's Lectionary for the Whole Church, Year W. Let's listen for a living word from God in these words from Psalm 50. Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and remit to the Most High your vows and call on me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. Yet to the wicked, God says, what is it to you to recite my, to recite my statutes or raise my covenant in your mouth? But you, you hate discipline and you cast my words behind you. When you see a thief, you befriend them, and with your adulterers you partake. You yet your mouth open upon evil, and your tongue crafts deceit. You sit and speak against your kin, against your own mother's child you raise slander. These things you have done, and I kept myself silent. You thought I would be like you. No, I rebuke you and lay the indictment before your eyes. Understand this, you who forgot God, lest I hear or lest I tear you apart and there be no one to deliver. They who bring a sacrifice of thanksgiving honor me and those who set upon the right way will I show the salvation of God. May God bless this reading and our hearing together and sow seeds of faithful response in our hearts. Amen. One of the challenges for any institution that lasts longer than just a couple of years, from a family to a business to a church, is the development of insider language. That's the lingo we use in-house to both reinforce group identity and also to establish a border, a barrier marking us apart from them. We know what we mean when we say X, but they don't because, of course, they wouldn't. We are the knights who say me. Over time, though, the meaning of such insider language can become increasingly opaque, even to us insiders, until we're left mouthing phrases or singing or praying or preaching them that we ourselves no longer fully understand. In the context of our community of faith, I call such insider language church words. You've heard me talk about that before. That's because they tend to be words we don't use much in our daily lives, except here in church or as we read scripture at church. This includes words like angel and leper, sin and salvation, even words like Pharisee or denarius, which once had very specific historical meanings, but to which we no longer have any living connection. They might as well be part of some entirely fantastical realm, like orcs and elves and ents. Idolatry is definitely one of those church words. I can't think of the last time idolatry came up in casual conversation outside of church, say over dinner with friends. Idolatry 
makes me think immediately of the churchiest of church words, the Ten Commandments, which God kicks off with two commandments on this specific subject in Exodus 20. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. And you shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth below, or that is in the water underneath the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Let's just put a pin in the jealous part there, and we'll circle back later. So we know from this reading that idolatry is bad. And that it has to do with turning from the worship of actual God to the worship of false gods, idols, or graven images, to use an even churchier word for it. The Hebrew prophets ridiculed those idols and those who worshipped them, even the craftspeople who made them. In Isaiah 44, 13 through 17, the prophet uses stinging sarcasm to highlight the absurdity of making an idol out of a material as ordinary as wood or iron or even silver or gold and calling it a god. They say, some woodcarver measures a piece of wood, then draws an outline. The idol is carefully carved with each detail exact. At last, it looks like a person and is placed in a temple. Either cedar or cypress or oak or any tree from the forest may be chosen, or even a pine tree planted by the woodcarver themselves and watered by the rain. Some of the wood is used to make a fire for heating or for cooking. One piece is made into an idol. Then the woodcarver bows down and worships it. He enjoys the warm fire and the meat that was roasted over it, over the burning coals of that same wood. But afterward, he bows down to worship the wooden idol. Protect me, he says. You are my God. Not to put too fine a point on it, the prophet sums up their mordant critique with this. How can anyone be stupid enough to trust something that can be burned to ashes? No one can save themselves like that. Don't they realize that the idols they hold in their hands are not really gods? Now, of course, at its linguistic roots, that's exactly what idolatry means, idol worship. That is worshiping some thing, particularly some human-made thing, as though it were God, or at least a God. In our shared Judeo-Christian traditions, that also means a strict ban on worshiping any god or gods other than the god of Abraham and Sarah and Hagar, the same god whom Jesus knew as Abba, Father, or more intimately, Daddy. Well, you can see the immediate challenge a strict reading of the commandments presents to good faith interfaith dialogue, particularly outside of our Abrahamic traditions. But within our own tradition, according to the letter of the law, as long as we're not carving our gods for ourselves out of wood or stone or creating literal golden calves to worship, we're good. But of course we're not. We're not good. Things aren't good. Because while we might not violate the letter of the law much these days, I don't see a lot of actual knock-on-wood idols in homes these days. We do violate the spirit of the law plenty. When it comes to substituting something for God at the center of our lives, something finite, something limited for the truly eternal, we are frequent offenders. And most frequently, in my experience, that something is us. Modern-day idolatry is a matter of creating God in our own image. It's about projecting ourselves, specifically our worst fears about ourselves and one another, and our very worst solutions to those fears 
projecting them out onto the universe and everyone else. It's about crowning them and calling them good and right and worthy of worship, even worthy of sacrifice. The sacrifice of our lives and the lives of others, even the life of the planet as a whole. Power, or our fear of being powerless, can be an idol that calls us to sacrifice the vulnerable. Money, or our fear of not having any, can be an idol that calls us to sacrifice the poor. Work can be an idol that calls us to sacrifice the weary, including ourselves. Guns, or our fear of other people, particularly people unlike ourselves, can be an idol that calls us to sacrifice one another's children, and even our own. Abundance, or our fear of not having enough, can be an idol that calls us to hoard resources. Just as consumption can be an idol that calls us to eat up the resources the natural world provides us. Independence, freedom, can be an idol that calls us to sacrifice our life-giving interdependence on one another and the earth. Comfort can be an idol that calls us to sacrifice necessary challenge and change. Certainty can be an idol that calls us to sacrifice wonder, tradition, habit, taste can all be idols that call us to sacrifice evolution, innovation, even revelation. Unity can be an idol that calls us to sacrifice our God-given diversity. Health, physical and mental, is an idol when it calls us to sacrifice the sick. Ability is an idol when it calls us to sacrifice those who are disabled, Settler colonialism, maleness, whiteness, heterosexuality, and cisgender identity are all idols when they call us to sacrifice the lives of the colonized, black and brown and indigenous people, other people of color, women, queer, transgender, and non-binary people. Despair, despair can be an idol when it calls us to sacrifice hope. And hope, hope can be an idol when it calls us to sacrifice the reality of our own or others' suffering. Even peace can become an idol when it calls us to sacrifice healthy, necessary, and just conflict for the sake of some status quo. Now, to be fair, as finite, all too human beings, we cannot ever fully comprehend the eternal. The fullness of the divine will always ultimately elude our reach, our grasping attempts to box them in. As Thomas Aquinas, that revered 13th century theological doctor of the church, famously articulated, all our language about God is metaphorical. And metaphor at its root is an attempt to hold together two things that are essentially unlike. God is not a rock. God is not a spring in the desert. God is not a human parent. The psalmist in our reading today reminds us of this baked-in limitation of the creatures before the Creator when they address us in God's own voice to say, What? Did you really think I would be like you? And just because we cannot say everything about God, just because metaphors are, by their own nature, limited, Friends, that doesn't mean we can't say anything true about God. Aquinas knew that too. God is steady like a rock. God is refreshing like a spring in the desert. God is at least as caring as a human parent. And in my own spiritual experience, Jesus himself is human, not divine, at least not in the way that the rest 
of God is words really begin to slip through our fingers at this point. But at the same time, Jesus is so like God. The metaphor is so apt that the boundaries between the two blur in meaningful and creative ways. Incarnation is perhaps our most powerful metaphor. Humanity and divinity held so closely together that they kiss. Of course, that's the core of my faith, which I believe is intended to be the core of the faith that comes to us from Jesus. God is unequivocally love. A love like the very best of our fierce, tender, just, and caring, transformative human love, but even and oh so much better. In our human limitation, we cannot help but create God in our own image, creating nearly infinite variations on the theme of the divine, the eternal, the ultimate source, guide, and goal of life and meaning. And we shouldn't beat ourselves up for that. It's who we are. Or for missing the mark, which we do over and over again. But God, who really is God, keeps calling to us from beyond our limitations. God calls to us to, calls to, us to keep searching, to keep pushing past the borders of the all-too-familiar to keep refining and reforming our faith and being reformed by it. Because, friends, even as we create God in our own image, the gods we create create us in turn. What we worship, we will become. That's a line that stuck with me this week. What we worship, what we hold as of utmost and ultimate significance in our lives, we will become and we will spend our lives trying. If we worship domination, we will become domineering. If we worship the law, we will become legalistic. If we worship justice without mercy, we will become uncaring. If we worship comfort, we will become too comfortable. If we worship certainty, we will become simultaneously sticklers and stuck. If we worship a whiffy, diffuse, and distant God, well, you can work that out for yourselves. Lucky for us, then, that God is not just like us. And lucky for us, our God is a jealous God, but not like that. Jealous, but not like that. Not like our own all-too-human petty jealousies, quick to suspect, quick to condemn, and even quicker to punish. I believe God is jealous like gravity is jealous. That's the other line that stuck with me this week. I believe God, God who really is God, lies at the center of all things, even at our center, and draws all things, including us, inexorably and lovingly Godward. Not away from the world, but deeper into it. If only we will make the faithful choice to let go of all our little artificial idols and let the larger God draw us closer into their ever larger, ever more loving, ever more just, ever more peaceful embrace. We can't get all the way there on our own, but if we turn and try, if we set our intention, if we reset it over and over again when our attention wanders, then God promises to carry us all the rest of the way. God promises to make our own lives more divine and so make the world around us more like heaven to show us that true salvation which is of God and which is for us and for all whom God has made. 
This is the choice before us today, and, and frankly, every day. This is not just a church choice. So what's it going to be? Are we going to keep looking for God in the mirror, which promises only a dim and distorted reflection of both our humanity and God's divinity? Or like Abraham, will we leave the comfortable discomfort of the supposedly known world and commit ourselves to looking for God in some pretty wild places? We're like Jesus. Will we treat the faith traditions we have inherited as a faithful, limited launching pad for our own extraordinary journeys of spiritual discovery that will push back the boundaries on who we think God can be, who we think we can be? Will we pledge ourselves to let go of all our cold and lifeless idols, even those we cherish dearly and polish daily, especially those. The search for signs of a larger, more loving God at the heart of the world who calls us, who calls all of us ever higher, ever deeper, ever onward, ever more humanely, ever more divinely, ever together.